Hi everybody, it's great to be back here again on Itama Friday afternoon now, it's a little later than usual, and we are going to begin our next lesson on Perkevot. First of all, a short um, story. This week we had a special, special event for our family, um, celebrating the Pidyon Haben, the redemption of our firstborn grandson. It's a very beautiful event, and you can enjoy the actual movie here on YouTube, you can find it. And it was, it was very special. The whole idea, the whole concept of firstborn is very, very... It's an amazing concept. It's amazing to study the Torah about it. And God willing, it warrants a lesson in itself, which I will try to find the time to, um, to talk about. So let's begin our next lesson on Birkei Avot. Today we're going to talk about Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach. He was the part of the third pair. We spoke about last week about Rabbi Huda ben Tabai. And Rabbi, Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach, he was the brother-in-law of a king, a famous king named Alexander Yanai. Alexander Yanai himself lived around 150 years or so before the destruction of the Second Temple. And he himself, Alexander Yanai, was a high priest, and besides being king, and he was also a part of the Sadducees. As we say in Hebrew, it's Dukim. There was a tremendous turmoil at that time period between the Purushim, which is more we would call today the Orthodox Jewry, as opposed to those like the Tzdukim who interpret things literally, etc. It was a tremendous turmoil between them and about leadership, etc. Rabbi Shunem and Shatach himself was persecuted because of his anti sadducee policies, and he had to run away, and his, his sister, um, the wife of Alexander Yanai, intervened on, on behalf of Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach and eventually he returned after running away. But what, what, what is he teaching us today? What are we going to learn about his words? He says, You must be very, very careful when you investigate the witnesses. Number two, Be very careful what you say. Perhaps... God forbid one will learn to, the litigants will learn to lie from your words as being a Dayan, as being one of the judges. So what is Rabbi Shem Ben Shatach trying to teach us? In order to understand this, we'll have to say another story, a small story about um, Rabbi Shem Ben Shatach. At his time period, he was very, very careful as far as, as being a teacher, as being a Dayan, as being a judge, and again he was the some people say the head of the entire court itself, the Nasi, or some people others say he was second in command, but he was a tremendous giant of Torah. And his lesson was you got to be very careful when you um, judge. And as uh, judges, you got to be very careful when you investigate the witnesses. And what happened? That there's a story that's related, that it's connected to this. Um, in his time period, there were a lot of witchcraft going around. And there's a story that he, in one day, killed 80 witches in order to eliminate these the dangerous forces in the land of Israel. And this was unusual for him. Why? Because, he, again, as I mentioned before, he was very, very careful. And at the same time, there's a story of someone running into a building with a sword. And he runs into the building. And then he runs out of that building with a sword full of blood. But there's no witnesses that saw what, what, that, that saw what went on in that building itself. So. He rules that although we found someone killed inside that building, you can't put him to death because that's not, there's no witnesses. So he was very, very careful as far as capital punishments we could see. It doesn't mean that the person wasn't arrested and, 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 and locked up, but he wasn't allowed to be killed according to Jewish law. And on one hand, we see Rabbi Shun ben Shatach being very, very careful, right? Although see, all the circumstantial evidence seems to point to the fact that this guy's a murderer, but still he didn't, he didn't put him to death. On the other hand, these 80 witches are put to death in one day, which according to the law, really, you're not supposed to kill more than one person a day. So you have to be very careful again when judging capital punishment. But this was an exception to the rule. As after that, when he did that, there were some people, family members of these witches that were very upset, and they got together and they hired two witnesses to lie in court about Rabbi Shimon ben Shatach's son. And after lying in court, they caused his son to be killed by the Jewish courts. Um, right before they were ready to take his son out to be killed, the, um, the son of Sel says, listen, I'm innocent, and if you witnesses are guilty, it's gonna, the punishment is going to fall on your head. And, that, and as right before they're ready to kill the son, the witnesses claim they lied, it wasn't true, but it was too late already, he was, someone was put to death. 
after this terrible incident, Rabbi Shimon and Shadda said, listen, he teaches us you must be so careful when you investigate witnesses, because if they would have been careful to investigate the witnesses about his son, his personal story, his son's life would have been saved. And that terrible story, of course, becomes part of the Torah here, as he teaches us this, this important, important fact about, as being a judge, about judging, especially when you're judging for cases of capital punishment, how careful we have to be. And the next thing he says, as far as, again, being careful, be careful with your speech, with your words. Perhaps one can learn to lie from them. And what is he referring to? He's referring to, again, the judges, when they are dealing with litigants, when they're dealing with um, whether it's monetary issues, whether it's capital issues, um, capital punishment issues, as we say, issues dealing with in Hebrew nefashot, they have to be very careful. Why? Because sometimes, as a judge, you may say, did you mean this? And if you say, did you mean that? If a person is not an honest, you know, one of the litigants is not honest, and he hears that, did you mean this? And he realizes, wait a second, this guy is, I have a certain um, escape route. He's, yes, I did mean that. You know, so you've got to be very careful how we speak to the, um, litigants, because sometimes we can actually, golf bit cause a, um, one of them to lie, and then the truth will not be re- um, resolved over here. Um, I think we have to ask ourselves an important question. I mean, the power of truth is so powerful, obviously. And but there's no, there's nothing greater than honesty and truth. We, it's something we all feel in our hearts. It's so natural. But where, where's the source of all that? Where does that all come from? This whole power of truth and being careful of what we say. So God forbid, one of the litigants is not going to lie because of us. Well, a judge has to realize that anyone involved in is being a judge or judging someone. To so realize that a judge is really, I guess, representing not himself. He's representing, of course, he's representing the creator of the universe, God. Now, when a judge comes in and hears the case, and his whole focus is to have the truth, and have, because right now, God has placed a situation in your hands. Here's one guy claiming that he's been cheated out of whatever amount of money, and the other guy saying it's not true. What you're going to do as a judge, your decision you're going to make as a judge, is going to return justice as the world. It's going to actually representing, you know, God over here. God is giving us the power as judges to make that decision. And that decision has to be, of course, admit. As we say, the first three words of the Torah begin with Bereshit bara lukim. Bereshit ends with a tav. That's the last letter of the first word of Bereshit, meaning in the beginning. Bara in Hebrew meaning created, the last letter of the word Baraz Aleph and the third word Elohim, meaning God the last letter is Mem, we put the three letters together, we spell Emet in Hebrew Emet meaning truth which means God <coughs> is hinting to us in the beginning of the Torah, the entire universe is created with truth and that's the foundation of the world, justice and truth it's so important and therefore those who deal with the part of the judi- judicial system must be honest and must strive all the time for that honesty and do whatever we can in order to make sure that the truth will be achieved in any instance. And that is so important. That's why it says that the judges are themselves are partners with God as creators of the universe. Because when you work hard in achieving that truth and that honesty in this world and then you are really you're really showing the world that Hashem is one that truth is really appears in this world. There's a world that we have to work so hard to get that truth out. And that's one of our great goals in this world. And of course, that's how the judicial system must be built on truth and justice. And again, we spoke about last week, unfortunate how unfortunate it is that we're so far from this point now. There's such corruption in this world. And let it be that the world will reach a high spiritual level and will return justice and truth to this world. And that would be, no doubt, the beginning of our redemption will help us help us greatly in getting that redemption on the way. Well, anyway, it's been great to be back again. Have a great Shabbat, and we'll see each other next week. Bye-bye.